I don't know about you, but I just think about um, how blessed a time that I have had in my life, the, the time that the Lord has brought me into this world, and the things that I've seen and enjoyed, and most of all, the true freedoms that I have had as an individual uh, in a country like this, and the opportunities with the, with the Word of God being always a- available to me, in places to come and worship, and in the tremendous friendship and the a wonderful fellowship that we have one with another, and, and it's been a real blessing. And I just thank the Lord for it, and I just want to just lift that up this morning. And I know that uh, this has been a little tough year for some, but by God's grace, we are still here, and uh, God is in control, and we know that each and every day, don't we? So with that, let's go ahead and open our Bibles this morning to uh, Daniel chapter 8 as we continue our study in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 8. And let's open with a word of prayer. Father, this is your time, your place, and your people. And Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have here this morning to come together. And Father, to worship. And Father, to be able to lift each other up. And Father, to be able to study. To have your word before us, Lord. And we just thank you for the multitude of blessings that we enjoy every day by thy hand. Father, each of us face different challenges in our life on a daily basis. And Father, we know that by thy grace, if we'll simply turn to you, you can give us peace and you can give us wisdom, you can give us understanding. It doesn't always mean that our situation straighten out and we can just go on. We no longer have the pain or the suffering or the financial challenge or those kind of things. But we can truly know, Lord, that you are, that your hand is upon us. And Father, that, that you'll never put anything on us that we're not able to bear and we just thank you for the wonderful blessing of of knowing lord that we we can truly come to you at any time your throne room is always open and father you are the friend that we can always count on in every situation help us to live lives that are truly father focused upon you and father uh, being aware of those that are around us that also may need father a word of encouragement or maybe just need the gospel itself Help us to be in tune to those opportunities and to open up and, Father, to help others to see the greatness and the true blessing it is that this season has represented the greatest gift that ever came into the world, you, Lord, that made a way of escape for each and every one that would simply receive you as their Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Our focus this morning is going to be on... on, uh, on, uh, Antiochus, and we're going to be looking in chapter 8 again, if you want to turn in your Bibles there, if you haven't already, it'll be chapter 8, uh, and we're going to be looking at Antiochus. You know, we've looked at the prophecy concerning him a little bit, but really beginning in verse 9 through 14, we've given a lot of, the Bible gives a lot of attention to the little horn, and we've seen the conquest of Alexander the Great with the rapid and short, uh, with the, well, the, as rapid as it was in short duration, and we also saw how the Greek culture has left a great, uh, a, a great uh, imprint on, on the world as, uh, the, as he conquered the areas. As, as one thing about uh, Alexander is he conquered the area. He brought in a lot of culture and a lot of different things in, in with him. And Ale- we know that Alexander's death, uh, when, at, at his death, his empire was literally divided into four different empires or, or different kingdoms, as illustrated with the four wings and the four heads of Daniel chapter seven six we know the grecian empire is described as the goat uh or the he goat with a with a principal horn and though mentioned only briefly in chapter 2 and verse 39 and in daniel chapter 7 verse 6 mostly in chapter 8 we see that this chapter is devoted primarily to the conquest of the meo persian empire as well as the rise of the grecian empire the the prophecy first clearly states that that the Meo Persian was the was the uh, is represented by the by the uh, by, by the two large horns and these and we know the greater horns of, of being that of the Persian Empire. Now in Daniel eight three we see it says the Bible says I lifted up my eyes and saw and behold there stood before the river a ram which had two horns and the two horns were high but one was higher than the other 
and the hire came up last. And I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. We also see that we know it, this is the, the Medo-Persian Empire, because it's, 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 uh, it's clearly identified in, in, chapter, in verse 20, if you look real quickly. It just says, The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of the Medes and the Persians. We see that during the two centuries of the Medo-Persian sway, that was two centuries, about, a two, about, about 200 years that they were, that they were literally in power, uh, that they were pretty much unopposed in everything. But after we saw all of this go on there, Daniel now goes on to give the stage of the Grecian Empire. We see what happens with the Grecian Empire under the figure of the he-goat. Now look at verse 21 of the same chapter, and we're going to see that he's identified as well, so we know who the he-goat is. It says, the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and there's Greece, and the great horn is between his eyes is the first king. So we know that we know this is uh, Greece, and we also know the first king was who? Alexander the Great. So we have this identified in the Word of God. Now what's interesting about this, these things take place about 200 years after this prophecy. And it's something for us to kind of keep in mind here. Now looking at verse 5, it goes on to say, And as I was considering, behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the, of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen, that which I had seen standing before the river, and, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come closely unto the ram, and he was moved with choler against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand against him. But he cast him down on the ground, and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. You know, this prophet, this prophetic vision was so accurately fulfilled as we see. The goat, we know, was the, with the one large horn is Alexander the Great. We see that, and we said that when Daniel wrote this 200 years before. Also, the two-horned ram... Uh, depicts the Persian Empire. We talked about that, how we had the Mio and the Persians, which made up that, that, that particular uh, empire, and the, the two represent uh, those two. And we know that uh, while the ram was actually destroyed, we learned that the he-goat, we see him at the height of his power, had his horn broken off. That, and we know he was the first king. And we know that that first horn was who? It was Alexander the Great. So we see how accuracy how accurate the prophecy is concerning these things. And this is just a miraculous, and it couldn't be done by anyone but, but the Lord. There's no way that we could ever see these things. But then we see that there were four prominent horns that grew out of that great horn that were broken off. Now again, this, this was an amazing prophecy that was fulfilled. That one is broken off. We see four come up. That represents those four generals that divided up his, his kingdom a little, later, a little later on. Alexander died in 323 B.C., and so we see that uh, it's also just interesting to note, I was, when I was doing some of my study, and one of the, one of the uh, people that I was reading mentioned this. He says, you know, that concerning just this prophecies concerning the Medo Persians and the Grecian Empire, there is over 135 prophecies in that, in that study. 135. Now remember, when we've looked at just eight concerning our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the tremendous statistical numbers that we came up with. Remember that? We talked about the silver dollars that, uh, that uh, uh, Stoner uses to, to describe it and says if you had them two foot thick and cover the, it'd cover the entire uh, state of Texas. And he talked about the accuracy of, of being able to predict or to find that one. If you took just one and marked it and put a blind man out there and asked him to find it, how, what would his chances be? But now we're looking at over 135 just concerning this particular area of the Scriptures. This is such a concise and graphic picture of the destruction of the Medo-Persian Empire and the division of the, Greek, of the Grecian Empire being split into four parts. You know, let's, let's realize that God is in history. He's the historical guide in a sense. Now, the Bible isn't a historical book, but anywhere that it touches on history, it's always what? 
right, isn't it? It's always right because it's the Word of God. It's always right. You know, he used Alexander's passion to spread the, the Greek culture to prepare the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because of Alexander's influence, coin, which was commonly the Greek, or what, would, what we'd say coin, or what that was was the Greek language. It was called coin, which was the, it was, which, which was the common language of that day of the civilized world. And we know that the New Testament is written in what? Greek. Quite a, quite a deal there. But now, let's turn our attention to the little horn. Look at verse 9 with me now. And it says, Out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. What is the pleasant land, my friends? It's the holy land, isn't it? It's, it's Israel. And the little horn is pro uh, the, 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 the little horn that's prophesied here was fulfilled, we know again, by Antiochus Epiphanes. These next verses can be very difficult, but it's important, again, if we mentioned this last week, as we look into our study, that we truly rightly divide the Word of God. We need to understand and rightly divide it and look at what the Word really says and in the context that it's given. Historically, this was, this was actually fulfilled by Antiochus Epiphanes in that he blasphemed and, he, and, and, and his true hatred of the Jews. We see that. And he hated the true God as well. And we're also going to see how it even broadens out more. And it talks about a little later on, at, right at the end of time, in the end of time or the end of the era here that's being spoken of, time of the Gentiles, the very end of that, will be the time of the Antichrist. And there we see again the same thing, the blasphemy, the hatred of the Jews, which was consistent with the Antichrist. Some have referred to the anti to, to, uh, to, to uh, Antiochus Epiphanes as the Antichrist of the Old Testament. Now look at verse 10 with me. And it says, And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of, prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. You know, in other words, what he's saying here, he wished to place himself among the stars, to exalt himself above all that was, all that was on earth. Now verse 12 says, And, and, a, host was given, and, a, and a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground and it pray, practiced and prospered. That is, that he was seeking to change the laws and to abolish the literal worship of Jehovah, to take all of the things that had to do with God, the right things, and, and to change those into something else. In 13, it goes on, And I heard one saint speak, and another saint say unto that, that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice? and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And he said unto me, Unto two thousand three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. You know, it's important that, that we note that this little horn, number one, it doesn't come out of Rome. This, this little horn we see comes out of Greece. It's important to really understand that. In comparing the history of the period and what Scripture reveals, one clearly can conclude that this is a reference to Antiochus Epiphanes, the ruler of Syria from 175 B.C. to 164 B.C. You know, secular history, especially if we were to go back and we, there's, uh, the, uh, if we look at 1st and 2nd Maccabees, reveals that, uh, that Antiochus was determined was a determined foe of the Jew, Jewish religion and did what he could to, dis, to stamp it out and to destroy it. In the process of Daniel 8 and 11 through 12 indicates that he stopped the sacrifices of the, te of the temple and caused, and caused its, its desolation. According to the scriptures, the temple would be desecrated for 2,300 uh, evenings and mornings before it would be Re, re, reconsecrated now verse 14 we see and it says 
And he said unto me, Unto two thousand three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Antiochus stopped the temple sacrifice. Stopped the temple sacrifice and set up pagan gods in the temple. He set up Zeus in there. He also had said that he, he, he sacrificed a pig upon the altar with a complete desecration of the temple. And he attacked the people of Israel, who, persecu- who particularly those that, that were worshiping, continued to worship the Lord after, after he had, had put a stop to all of that. He literally killed thousands of men, women, and children as a result of that. He was a horrible person to the Jews. This, this, uh, this actually uh, uh, is what inspired uh, Judas uh, Maccabees to, and his sons to, to, uh, to rise up in, in revolt against him at the end of this period. Now the period of 2,300 mornings and evenings should be considered as 2,324 hours. Uh, it's 2,024 days. In other words, 24-hour days. Not years, as some have, su- have suggested, attempting to make it 1844 as a prophetic date. You know, I went and I looked up 1844 to see if anything significantly happened in that time. Well, there were some significant events, but nothing that would have had to do with anything to do with any kind of prophecy or anything to really do with, uh, w- with the Bible that I, that I could find. This is a period in which, in which the temple was desecrated. It was from uh, 171 B.C. to 165 B.C. Approximately six years, a little longer than six years, but about six years that this went on. We know that Antiochus eventually gave in. The temple was reconstructed and the Jewish re- religion was renewed. Antiochus died of a natural causes while conducting a war in 164 B.C. Because the actions of, of Antiochus in desecrating the temple and stopping the sacrifices since, uh, system paralleled what is described of the little horn in chapter 7. Remember, the little horn speaks of two different times or two different events. The one that we're talking about right now is the one uh, that, it, that involves Greece at the end of their reign, Antiochus Epiphanes. The other is the Antichrist. And we see that there's a great parallel between them, and that's what we're trying to see here this morning. You know, it talks about that little horn of seven of whom it is said that he would abolish the daily sacrifices. That knows that this is talking about the Antichrist. He's going to abolish the sacrifices. We know from the Word of God that's true, don't we? That's what's going to happen with him. And we also know that he's going to cause an abomination in the temple. He's going to insist that people worship him. And, of course, we know it certainly is true of the Antichrist. Now, look at verse 11 with me. It says, From that time the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abominations that make desolate set up, and there shall be 1,290 days. Some have sought to kind of bring these two prophecies together. But, again, if we carefully consider the Scriptures, I believe it's clear that we should see there's both a near and a far fulfillment of prophecy here. Antiochus and his reign are now, are, are now history and along, along with the desecration of the temple. We can look back from where we are. It was looking forward for Daniel, but looking back from where we are today. However, these, these passages seem to, to anticipate the ultimate desecration of the temple, which will be during the time of the Antichrist, where they'll, again, there will be the stopping of the sacrifices with this future rule uh, uh, world ruler and the little horn of Daniel chapter 7 8 this ruler will dominate the world and we know that he's going to have complete domination of the world for three and a half years before the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ now let's look at the interpretation of the vision as we begin in chapter in verse 15 now and it says and it came to pass when I even I Daniel had seen the vision and sought for the meaning Then, behold, there stood before me as the appearing of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Eula, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell down upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at this time of the end, shall be the vision now as he was speaking with me 
I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground. But he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the, in the last end, what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For all, for at that time appointed the end shall be. The vision refers to the time of the end. Gabriel assures Daniel that this vision had to do with the end times, with the latter times, and also the, the, the indignation of, of that time. This is a problem for some because we see that, that the prophecy in Daniel 8, verses 1 through 14, was fulfilled, as we've already seen in our studies, uh, with the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, and, and the Greek empires, especially in the time of, 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 of Antiochus Epiphanes. We see how that, that has already come to pass, has already been fulfilled. So the term, the times of the end, in the, in the latter times of indignation, commonly refers to what we think of as the end times. Not events more than a hundred years before the time of our Lord, uh, before the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So what's the answer? Well, the, well that although the prophecy of, of Antiochus Epiphany has already been filled, it also has a later fulfillment in the Antichrist, which is referred to as, as, the, as, the, as, as the time of the end. Antiochus Epiphanes is sometimes called the Antichrist of the Old Testament, and he prefigures the, uh, the Antichrist of the end times. Now, just as Antiochus Epiphanes rose to power with force and intrigue, you know, so will the Antichrist, as, we, as we've, seen some of our, we've seen our study of the book of the Revelation many years ago. But we also know that he's, that, that he's going to persecute the Jews, anti epiganus anti uh, And Antiochus Epiphanes, we know, is going to be a great persecutor of the Jews. But we also know so will the Antichrist. He's going to turn in the middle of that, uh, middle of that seven years, at three and a half, and really turn on the Jews. We know that, uh, that, uh, that Antiochus also stops the sacrifice, sacrifices and the desolation of the temple. So will the Antichrist. And he also seems to be a, a real success. When you look at what he's done and all that's going on, it looks like Antiochus is just... Uh, just a man, and he's got everything under control, and he's got all the power. He's such a, really succeeding at what he's doing. And we know that would be true of the Antichrist as well. And so from, the, from, from Antiochus, so, so from what, from what Antiochus did, did to the Jews in his days, uh, one may know what, I think what we can see here, when we look at this in this study, we can see what is going to be somewhat of what's going to happen during the time of the Antichrist at the very end times. But it, let us keep in mind, we've, as bad as all of this is, as horrible as all that we read about concerning Antiochus, it's nothing compared to what it's going to be like under the Antichrist. The world will never have seen like it will be during that time. But it does give us the general pattern of what the Antichrist will do in a future world. You know, Greece, with all of its refinements and culture and art, produced the Old Testament, many would say. You know, we look at that. But we see that while, but, but and many, many would say also that, that, Christ, that the so-called Christian nations produced in the New Testament the Antichrist. Both of these we see in both, both areas, but we know that both of these situations are going to be true. One thing I think that's so wonderful about the Word of God is that God truly knows the end from the beginning, doesn't he? Doesn't he know the end from the beginning? So what we can see is, is even before all of these events are going to take place, God already knows what's going to have to happen. He already knows what everything is going to happen, how things are going to come about, and what's going to be needed to bring in the salvation of this world. Opportunity upon opportunity upon opportunity is given. Judgments given. Opportunities and opportunities continue to come. And he has given in his word these things that we see now that can help us today understand better of what we're looking at. Now look at verse 20 with me, if you would, please. It says, The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of, Mede, of the Medes and the Persians. And the rough goat is the, is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now, that being broken, 
whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation. Not one, but, but, not, but, not, but not in his power. You see this large horn between the eyes we know was the first king, which we know was, uh, what was done there was fulfilled by Alexander the Great in history. And we saw also how these four kingdoms shall rise up out of that nation, but not with its power. And that's all it's saying there is that these four nations, as they rise up, are not ever going to have the power that, 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 uh, that Greece experienced under the time of, uh, of Alexander the Great. That's gonna, his power was so much greater than any of that. So they're not even going to come close to being, being where he was. Now in verse 23, it, um, we go, go on and it says, In the latter times of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding, and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper, and shall practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policies also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of, of princes, but he shall be broken without hands. Against God is what's speaking of the ruler of the kings of the earth. Verse 26, and the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. You know, in the latter times of the kingdom, the prophecy of this passage reads equally true of both the Antichrist and of, 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 of Antiochus. This is an example of the prophets of a prophetic passage passage that has both a near and a far application many many of them do we know that as we look at the scriptures that we find that many prophecies will have a relatively soon application in this case we look about 200 years after this where we see antagon uh, antagon i sure will yeah antagonist i got it and antagonist i have to and in this part i have so much of it. antagonist but anyway we see how both of these two and the difference in them. So we see him come up first. We see many, many parallels here. And what he's doing, he's paralleling what's going to be happening when we get to the book of the, when you, when you look at what the Antichrist does in the very, very last days of the time of the Gentiles. So this is all just kind of coming together. Only as God can put all these things together. And we see so much prophecy. And we're going to see more of this as we continue in our study of the word of God here in, in, in Daniel. But it's so important here. And then in verse 26 it says, In the vision of the evening, the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. You see, it's for a latter time of the, of the kingdom. This, prophe this, this prophecy is a passage that reads equally true, as we mentioned, for both Antigonus, uh, yeah, and Antigonus and, and, and the Antichrist, both as a near and far prophecy. Having a fierce, having, having fierce features, Antigonus Epiphany was known for his cruel brutality, but he was also, but also, we know it's true of the coming of, of the Antichrist. We will see the same thing as he turns upon the Jewish people in the end times. Remember when he comes, what's he going to do? Talking about the Antichrist. One of the first things he's going to do is he's going to make peace with Israel. He's going to be a man of such, uh, such, such charisma and people are just going to be really drawn to him. He's going to seem like the real answer to the world. Do you think the world today is looking for somebody to come along and really just kind of say, look, just give it to me and I can straighten everything else. I can bring peace to everything. And we can have a wonderful world. Do you believe Is that the time might be getting close for that sort of thing? We need it today. We're looking for somebody like that. Well, guess what? There's going to be a man come like that. He's going to be the end. He's going to have great charisma. He's going to have a real ability. And people are going to be so fascinated by him. And he's going to go to the Jews. And he's going to say, look, I can bring you peace. And he's going to sign this great treaty with them. And they are going to think, oh, how wonderful everything is. Look at all that's come. 
Look at this great peace that we can now have in the world. And we can do what we want to do. We can, the temples, can, we can rebuild the temples. We can have our sacrifices. We can do all those things that we haven't been able to do for so many years. It's been so hard. And then, at the middle of that three and a half years, what happens? He turns. He doesn't turn a little bit. He turns horribly upon them. You know, we, as, as we read about in Matthew, we see in, in chapter 24 where the Bible tells, tells us that what they should do in that day is flee to the mountains. Get out of the city. Hide. It's going to be a horrible time for three and a half years. Well, you know, with, 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 with anti-epiphanies, uh, uh, his situation lasted over six years. But it wasn't as, it's still not as severe as it's going to be during that time. We can't even imagine today what that time is really going to be like. We also see in this, we see, we see as we just talked about, his sinister scheme and through cunning and how cunning he's going to be. And he's going to have this flattering and such smooth tongue. Both he and the Antichrist are going to have this in common. But we also see it's not going to be by his might, the Bible tells us. When we look at these verses. We see that it's going to be by what? It's going to be by a supernatural power. No, it's just going to be by Satan. He's going to have a lot of power. And God's going to allow him to have that power. Just as the Antichrist is going to have a lot. Remember, there's a lot of miracles and things the Antichrist is going to do in the end. The Bible actually says if it was even possible that we would believe that this, that this, uh, that, uh, uh, that we, would, that we would believe on him because of the miracles and things he'll be doing in that day, even for the saints. But that's not going to be the case. Why is that not going to be the case? Because we're not here, are we, Norman? We, we're gone. This is during the time of the tribulation. We're up and out of here, aren't we? So we're gone. So we're not in the world anymore. That's why it can't happen to us. But he's going to be very, very convincing. And, 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 and Antiochus had this somewhat in common with him, but not quite on that. But remember, he's empowered by Satan himself. And it's the same will be true of the Antichrist. You know, both of these are going to prosper and they're going to thrive. Antiochus Epiphanes looks like a total success. Just as the coming Antichrist will look like a complete winner. And until God topples his reign. And he shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. He's going to destroy the mighty and the holy people. Who are the holy people? That's right, the children of Abraham. Very, very good answer. Primarily the Jews, right? We're looking at the Jews here. The, the holy people, the war. It's good for us to keep in, in focus. We're looking at the Word of God. The references of how we see things in the right perspective. And understanding that although, yes, as the Gentiles, particularly in the New Testament and throughout the epistles and all, and all of those applications to the church are wonderful. But in reality, when we look at the Bible more from a historical and as God moves through it, we see it primarily deals always with Israel, doesn't it? When we look at the New Testament, it's like we put a little parentheses between this and that. When we get the book of Daniel, I mean, of, of the uh, 70 weeks of Daniel, which we will in our next study as, as we begin chapter 9, what we find is, is that it, that, that prophecy that, that, Dan, that Daniel gives comes right up and then stops at the 69th week. And there's a little pro, uh, phase also in Daniel chapter 9 where we see it sort of stops. Well, we know it stopped now for how long? 2,000 years, right? But we also know there's still one week remaining. And that's the week of the tribulation. And we're waiting for that period to come. Now keep it in mind too, at the same time that Daniel wrote the book, he had no idea there were going to be two advents of the Lord. He had no idea. To him, there, there is no church. So when we're studying in the Old Testament, a lot of times the things that we see, we have to remember the church is never part of it in that sense. So keep that focus in mind. But he's talking about the holy people. Not only is he going to destroy his enemies, but he's also going to harshly persecute the people of God. The coming Antichrist will also destroy and persecute the Jew on a scale the world has never seen. He shall cause deceit to prosper. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I can see a lot of that today. 
Do you see a lot of deceit in the world today? Do you see a lot of, of false things being said, truth being twisted and turned, or just out and out lies being called truth today? Deceit, deceiving people of the actual truth. It's going to be hard. It was certainly hard during, the, during this particular time for the Jews during, during, during I, 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 um, an antagonist uh, rule there when he was on the throne. We see how he literally killed so many, persecuted them unmercifully. But it's even going to be worse at the time of the Antichrist for anyone that seeks to worship the Lord. So where does that truth come from? My friends, the truth is the Word of God. It's the Word of God. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. There is no other way besides me. We know that the Word... As we see in John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we see that these two are together, and when we're thinking in terms of rightly dividing the Word of God and understanding, true wisdom and knowledge must come from this book. This is where it truly is. And it says, He shall cause them the deceit that we've seen. Both the ruler... uh, Antiochus Epiphanes in the past and the Antichrist in the future are, are marked by deceit. 2 Thessalonians 2.9 says, Even him whose coming is after the work of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all deceitfulness of unrighteousness, in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. With all deceivableness and unrighteousness please notice who's how is all that happening by the working of satan by the working of satan satan is the prince and the power of the air of the world right we know that remember that god rules and overrules in all things though but god has given satan an opportunity in this world because you and i know none of us deserve the least the least of his mercies, but yet he's made a way of escape, as we've just witnessed this week, through his son Jesus Christ, a price that we could never, we could never pay on our own. And his son stepped out of, set aside the glory that he had with the Father, set aside, never set aside his deity, but stepped out of that glory into this world and humbled himself even unto death of the cross to make a way that you and I can once again be made righteous. For our God is a righteous God, and there's no unrighteousness in Him. There needs to be a way that we could become righteous. And we become righteous through Christ. It's through His finished and complete work on the cross. We need to always remember that. Don't want to get too far off here. But we shall see Him as He's, and He exalts Himself in His heart. You know, the coins of... of, of, of uh, of, of, Ant- of Antiochus, we, we realize that they were inscribed with a title. And the title was Theus Epiphanes, which means God manifest. Look at the back of your coin. God manifest. That's who you're serving. What is the manifestation of God? What's he saying about himself? He's God, isn't he? He's a, putting himself on that same level is God we see we also know that this is going to be true of the of the coming of the antichrist who will also exalt himself for example in second thessalonians 2 4 it says who opposeth and exalt himself above all that is called God speaking of the antichrist or that is worshiped so that he as God sitteth on in the temple of God showing himself that he is God There's only one God, and that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's our Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, three in one, that created everything that is, literally spoke the world into existence. Everything that exists, exists by Him. And His word of truth is as true today as as, as it was when it was written, as true as it is today before this world ever was. And it will be true for all eternity past. 
And we have nothing to fear in this day. Why? Because He is the eternal God. And His Word is also eternal. And you know something? You and I, as His children, have received eternal life. We are a part of His eternal plan and His eternal kingdom. And no matter what kind of challenges we may face, as the, just as we see with the children of, of uh, Israel here, or, or, or the Jews during the time of, of, of Antiochus, or, or, during, or the time to come with the, with the Antichrist, because we won't be here for that, but we can see the tremendous challenges, the decisions that they would have had to make. It, was not, it would not have been an easy time. You make a decision here and your life is in jeopardy. Your family is in jeopardy. We're already seeing that today. We're seeing where people that take a political position may lose everything that they own. Their families may be threatened with all kinds of different things that are going on. We can see all of these things, but this is nothing compared to the reality that will be coming. And today we talk about Big Brother. They talk, used to talk a lot about my day. Well, Big Brother's already here. With all the cameras, all the internet, all that's done, there's very little that is private that anybody has any real privacy about anymore. Anybody can be found or, under, or, or sought out or destroyed. We see a whole different kind of thing here, but it, yet it's not different because God's Word has already prepared us to be ready for these things. My friends, we can live life in victory, and we should. Because our Savior conquered the world. He conquered it before the world even was. But when He came back and made a way of escape for you and I, He set up a way that we could, once again, be right with Him, and therefore right for all eternity, and we have an eternal, we, we, we have an eternal position as a child of God, part of His family. You know, the Bible tells us, believe it or not, that you're an heir. How many people in here are heirs? Heirs of God. Heirs of God. With Jesus Christ. I don't deserve to be saved. How could I deserve anything like that? Only because the Word of God tells me so. Only because the Word of God says it's so. And everything God says is true. So I can be confident in my walk today knowing that these things are true. You know, there's so much more we can look at here. He shall rise against the prince, and it's talking about God here, truly the Antichrist, which is true of the Antichrist, who will hate the Jews because he hates God. This is the biggest thing that was going on here. In no similar way will man defeat the coming Antichrist but with the hand of Jesus, he will strike him down. Revelation 19.20 says this. We realize that, in other words, just as Antiochus, we know, died basically of a natural causes, as the Bible tells us he was going to. He wasn't killed in battle. He wasn't, didn't die of some other way. He died somewhat of a natural cause. But also, we see the Antichrist is similar there too. He says, and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them which, which worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of the of, of fire burning with brimstone, burning with brimstone. Therefore, let us seal up this vision, Daniel was told. Daniel must do this because in his day the vision referred to a period so distant and would have been very difficult for most to understand. It was for us in our time. And we can see that when we look a little further, and we see this in the book of the, uh, of the Revelation. Let's see, where did I put that? I had it here somewhere. But we see it in the book of the Revelation when it tells us how we are to, the, well, first of all, I'll just tell it. Oh, here we go. Uh, Revelation in chapter, very first part of Revelation, you open that book. Who wrote the book of the Revelation? John? Was it John? John penned it, but who wrote it? The Bible says it's whose who's revelation? It's Jesus Christ's revelation. John penned it, but the Bible calls it the revelation of Jesus Christ. Very important. But that very first verse says this. It says, 
Blessed is he that readeth. Now who's that speaking to? That's speaking to us in this dispensation, in this time. This is a time for us to understand these things. Blessed is us that he readeth. And he that heareth the words of this prophecy. And keep these things which are written therein. For the time is what? At hand. At hand. It can, it, at any time we can be expecting this. And then in Revelation 22.10 it goes on to say, And he said unto me, Seal not the saying of, this, uh, of the prophecies of this book, for the time is at hand. I'm just going to conclude with this. Looking at verse 27, it says, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. After, afterwards I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. These are very, very important words. First of all, just as we saw at the end of chapter 7, where Daniel was just in as much in awe and couldn't understand and and was, uh, had fear in his heart about it. He took, we talked about the two years until this one comes out. Now he has this. He finishes it up the same way. And he realizes he has written this, he's written this down as God has given it to him. But even he can't understand it. He doesn't know what he's written. He just knows that God has given this to him. Some of it he can understand. But there's a lot of it there that he can't understand. Why? Because it's to be sealed up until the end time, till our time till the time of the dispensation of the church. During this church age, when it would finally open back up again, and we would have this finished up by the, by the Apostle John, who will bring this all into fruition. That's why the book of Daniel is so important. If you're going to understand the book of the Revelation, you need to see this book and understand it, to rightly divide the Word of God and understand how they all tie together and see how God's plan all comes together. Yes? Excellent. That's right. And tells them. That's right. And the, the interesting thing, the only part she didn't mention there was when he said that, he also said this, spoken of by who? Daniel by Daniel the prophet. He's making that reference, taking it right back to where we are right, right, right here today. How all of it fits together, the wonderful Word of God, doesn't it? But there's all purpose in this. And you and I need not fear about anything. What is death except the graduation in reality? If we have the right attitude, we look forward to the time being present of the Lord, but we don't want to forget that while God has us here in this land, in this, in, on this earth, and on this planet, we have work. He has a plan for each of us. It's not just a word, just a number in, in, in his uh, kingdom. He really has an individual plan for each of us, and he wants us to seek that out. And we don't know who and, and what that plan is. For, for any of us. And I believe we all only know ours on a daily basis in the sense you take one step at a time seeking out this day to follow the Lord. Seek His counsel, the wisdom that He shows you. Seek to follow the direction that He shows you for each day and He will by God's grace. But we do need to be in His Word to understand the basics of that and to understand this and understand how wonderful this book is is how it all comes together and brings us all to one place. Well, let us go ahead and close. And uh, Norman, would you close this morning, please, brother?